Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 141. 141 in a brand new year. Happy New Year. Merry New Year's. Uh, how are you feeling in 2023? Oh... <laughs> That good already. That's good already. Oh. I mean, it's January. It's a bit gloomy, isn't it? January's are a bit gloomy. It is. January so. really has turned up with full gloom. arsenal of gloom. <laughs> Just full gloom. Here is rain. <laughs> here is wind. Here is darkness. But you know what? It's not long until the light comes back. We've passed Yule. The light is returning. Yeah, that was ages ago. I know, but... St- but a d- d- week ago that happened. <laughs> <laughs> St. Bridget's Day is coming. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to make one of those bad crosses no, again. No, you ain't. I'm really not. Really <laughs> not. No, I'm saying the light is coming. The light is returning. Okay. Have you got have you got New Year's resolutions? No. No? None? No. <laughs> okay, on Patreon a couple of days ago, you were like, I'm up for more adventures. More I'm adventures. ready. More adventures. Oh, fuck it. <laughs> Fallen at the first hurdle. Yeah, absolutely. Adventures are sounds hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready and excited for 2023. A world of possibilities is finally back with no, us. No, it's not. <laughs> It's all <laughs> dreadful. Now the, the, the threat of lockdown seems to have been taken away completely. It's like there's a lot of pressure on us now, isn't there? Got to do stuff. Oh, God. We've got to do stuff. Yeah, exactly. I quite <laughs> quite enjoyed being sort of governmentally contracted to do nothing for two years. <laughs> <laughs> so it like, was the dream. I was like, oh, crap. Better go outside now. Outside. There's, oh, there's outside people out there. There are. I saw them out the window and they look scary. You know what? It's 2023. We're all together. We're together and our beautiful Poisoners Cabinet listeners are together. We're going to get through this piece. People. We want to know what your New Year's resolutions are, what you're happy about, what you're excited about. If you're feeling down, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you know what? We're here for you. The, these little podcasts get people through in the darker Absolutely. time. Listen to our nonsense, you'll be fine. Exactly. Nothing is as bad as them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you listen going, oh, at least we don't have to do this. <laughs> My life is so much better than that. <laughs> So yeah, it's great. We're really glad that we've been here for you guys for the last year or for the last nearly three years that we've been doing this. It is mad, but we are still here for you and we want to be positive and happy. You don't need a new you. You just need to keep being you and keep talking about poison. (laughs) Speaking of which, any poisonings this week? Um... Possibly, but who can say? You're just very confused. Everything is just so like, oh, they could just be, (laughs) they could just be flumped on the floor from gloom. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> or they could be dead that is you a just, great new way to die you just don't know death by gloom death by gloom that is definitely something in one of those victorian lists <laughs> she died from gloom gloom the gloom got to her yeah a four on the flumpy scale dreadful flump she had the music to the flumps is now just going through my head going <laughs> in now? a victorian tone the, the flump. flumps what are the flumps the cartoon the flump da 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 did. I know you're only a tiny bit younger than me, but you, you must remember you, the flumps. You make stuff up. I I lie. I, 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 you I, see, I, you I, just I, said I lie. I caught you there. I'm liable to yell at you. That's what. I'm shocked you don't the know the flumps. flumps. No. I'm going to Google it in a minute. When oh, we yeah. make the cocktail, you're going to have to watch a whole episode of the flumps. They were mar- flumps were marshmallows. They are also marshmallows. They were marshmallows. No, they weren't marshmallows in the program. You know what? You know this could go on for a while. Next, you're going to deny the moomins, and then that's just it. No, no, I can't. No, no I shouldn't, shouldn't do such a thing. <laughs> well, speaking of cartoons that may not exist, and getting through the January malaise, I think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Mm, yes, indeed. Hopefully, they ex- actually do exist. So, thank you very much to. Renee Height. To Matilda Hansen. To Amy Schaumburg. Kylie Stifel. And to Jenny. Mm, mm. You guys are very, very sexy. Thank you very much, darlings. Thank you for joining us. We have had fun over on Patreon. Have we? We have. We had a good Q&A session. That was quite fun. For the season. Great questions from people. Lots of lots of big life questions pondered. We've been talking about murder and poison, as always. We've mm. actually tackled a couple of unsolved mysteries. Oh, mysteries. Mysteries. We delved into the mysteries that do involve death, but <laughs> not a strict murder. We, we went to the Bennington Triangle. Yeah. And that was fun. I like that one. People were here for it. Yeah. 
So Maybe some more of them coming up. We are thinking ahead to what we're going to be doing in season four. It's coming up, people. So suggestions of uh, different kinds of things that we could be covering that are still within the, the Poisoner's Cabinet Remit. ballpark. Yes, absolutely. Within Cityscape. Within our oeuvre. It's within our estate. Would be welcome from you. So do leave them in the comments if you are interested in Patreon. For $5 a month, you get an extra episode every single week. There is a $15 a month tier for the Cyanide Connoisseurs where you get an extra monthly episode and some extra sexy content. Content, plus bloopers and videos and other things like that and Nick just yelling at me <laughs> mainly mainly yelling but we'd love to have you over there and it's completely flexible as well and good for a gift if you've forgotten to buy anyone something for Christmas give them us absolutely and it does indeed help us too to stock the poisonous cabinet mm. and to keep things going so we can, we can record such exciting things well Nick are you ready mm. what happens if I say no it's the new year you've I've got to be, got to be full positive. Oh, positive, positive, positive pep positive. and vim what was, why did you frown? Pep and Vim. Yeah, those are old-timey words. How long have you known me? <laughs> are those two phrases words that have ever been ever associated <laughs> with with my forty long, <laughs> long years on this world? Pep and Vim. Uh, occasionally, if I hold a Negroni in front of you, you have a slight <laughs> skip in your step. It's, it's like a donkey with a carrot on, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, but even so, it's like four steps. You go, oh, no, nothing's worth <laughs> Nothing this. Nothing worth that. <laughs> Nothing. I <laughs> let me die in the street. <laughs> there's there's a whole charity set up of, you know, like, save the donkey, save the Nick. He needs more Negronis. Or we or... can drink poison and talk about cocktails. Um, no, I've been told to do the first one out of pain of <laughs> horrible, horrible things. <laughs> Let's go with the first yes. one. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is my story this week. And we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell. And it will flavor our cocktail of the week. And this week's secret ingredient is Paris. La Paris. Paris. La Paris. I should have some accordion music behind you should, this, absolutely. shouldn't I? Yes. Not that we like to stereotype. Not the at French. all. No, and a man on a bicycle with baguettes and garlic <laughs> is just cycling through the cabinet as we speak. <laughs> I think that's Greg. That's what he. That is his want. He wears stripy outfits and that's he loves drink. garlic. It's just Greg. He's a hidden Frenchman. Yes, Paris is our ingredient. A place of love, of wonderful flavors, of art, of expression. I think it's a good source. We we've done a few Parisian-based cocktails before. We've had the left bank. The Left bank, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and, was that and one. others. And some other ones, which I can't actually remember what they are, but I'm sure we've done, I'm sure we've done some other. <laughs> well, some ones. that were in French. But we haven't got any of those. None of those. Because we've already done them. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Yeah. This wasn't the one where you were going to go, I'm going to recycle this Go one redo because it, redo it. fuck you. <laughs> Not this time. I did think to myself, when you think Paris, apart from all those stereotypical things, horrendously stereotypical things you just said, yeah. what does spring to mind? Uh, the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, yeah, uh, Notre Dame. Oh God, it still hurts. <laughs> the Moulin Rouge, yeah, the, the Seine, the Seine, going the Louvre, as you said. But none of those. We're not having any of those. None of those. Well, we are actually having one of those that you said. Oh, one of them. One, one, one that. <laughs> you had that all lined up it, in your I head. Had it all, all worked out, and you said the thing that you shouldn't have said, and it was going to be brilliant, and you ruined it, and I want to go home. You are home. Fuck. That was fast. <laughs> All right, shall I pretend that I didn't say it? I have no idea what I said. I said the Seine and the Louvre. We're having an Eiffel Tower, okay? <laughs> that was the first fucking thing. I know it was. It. You ruined it. It's in the bloody picture I put out. The Tour Eiffel. The Tour Eiffel. Ah, bon, mais oui. Sacré bleu. Sacré bleu. Okay, I'm going to say right now, people, because it's already started. I was going to save this for later. But yes, we are going to France for this story, shockingly. And there will be accents. Okay, there will be accents. And My I... French accent is notoriously good. It is very good. It is often spoken about in France. In France. Yeah. And The Hague, worryingly. <laughs> Are you comparing my French accent to a war crime? <laughs> I'm not. I'm just saying what has happened. But when we do accents and when we do these things, it is nothing condescending. It is just because we have to tell the story. If anyone at any point feels uh, uncomfortable with the accents we're doing, we give you full reign to take the piss out of us. Oh, so gotcha. do all the Irish stereotypes that you want. Just go, ha 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 ha, I'm trying to make you drive and I'm stealing your pig. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Nick's from 
Margate, so he'll cut you, and then uh, there is that. yeah, and then charge you ten pounds for a latte because ooh, gentrification. <laughs> <laughs> we're all hipsters down here. We're all hipsters down there, and you're from Yorkshire as well, apparently. <laughs> now Margate, all like that, it's all like that. I don't know. I talk like this. You didn't used to, I bet. I did actually. I was always very posh for Margate. How did that work out for you? I, um, considerable beatings. <laughs> And but we're having a Tour Eiffel. Tour now Eiffel. is it is it a Tour Eiffel or is it the Eiffel Tower? No, it's a Tour Eiffel. A Tour Eiffel. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm glad. I think it's high time for us to have a cocktail. So let us sachet into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Uh, bonjour. 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 Ça va? Ça va bien? Ah, we are in Paris, Nick. Ah, it is wonderful. And we are looking at the Tour Eiffel. Tour Eiffel. And it is very beautiful. Yeah. Because you brought out your beautiful glasses. The nice glasses. Which are Eiffel Tower S. I mean, they're all lovely, my glasses. They I'll are. Have, you know. These ones are particularly lovely. These ones are particularly lovely. They're lovely. And it is a brown. Brown drink. It is brown drink. Like the tower itself. Is the tower brown? No. It's grey. Is it, though? Is it, so? yeah. it grey, black, eye brown? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going with grey. Big with your truths. <laughs> with, yeah, with your, you and your facts. You and your facts. So it is a very beautiful drink. Oh, I, I shall venture a guess that it's spirit forward. Um, yes, let's go with that. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess we should dive in. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Happy New Year. <sighs> that is spirit forward. Oh, wow. there's certainly some spirits there. Oh, sorry. I'm tapping the table now. That's 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 a that's a pretty spirit forward one. <laughs> it's not unpleasant. Mm. That's the most spirit forward I think we've had in a while. I can see through time. Uh, yes, I was just going to say exactly that. <laughs> but it's interesting. There's the, mm. there's stuff. There's, there's, <laughs> there's definitely things. stuff going on there. I'm staring really intently at the wall. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> mm. Do you like it? Nick seems very happy. <laughs> it, sorry, there's a lot of noises. Right, I'm going for a second it's, sip. That's, that is good. That is good. I mean, it's you'd have if you have more than one of these, you're going to be crying in a corner. Oh, the second sip is better. But there's, oh, there's so much going on. There's a lot going on there. So much going on. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, what are you getting? There's something twiggy in there. Mm. There's something twiggy. There's something medicinal and twiggy. Tingles the nostrils. <laughs> but there's also fruit. But not a fruity fruit. <laughs> not a fruity fruit. An unfruity fruit. Give, I, me, give I, me your best guess. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this. Um, has it got che- cherry? Nope. Almond? Nope. Uh, has it got chartreuse in it? No. It hasn't got chartreuse. Benedictine? D- 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 Straker? N- nope. <laughs> so I'm just grasp- grasping at straws now. I really am not sure. This uh, apricot. Apricot? No. <laughs> <laughs> has it got anything in it? It's got Is nothing. it just water? It's just brown water. <laughs> it's just brown and water together. Brown and water and your imagination. Oh, uh, <laughs> Bourbon? No. I don't I don't know what's in it. Tell me what's in it. So what's happening is a lot of crazy things. Shit. What? <laughs> so the herby thing you were thinking of, we've got some absinthe. So oh, for got, we've, God's sake, of course. We've got, we've got absinthe. So yes, you, you've got that one right. We've got absinthe. <laughs> we're but it's only, a, it's only a little dash. It's only <laughs> a little splash, but it comes out quite strongly. We have a Quantro. Well, not Quantro. We have a triple sec. Towards the point. Oh, so that could be where you're getting your fruity shenanigans That is. From. That's it. Because I kept thinking there was orange. So yeah, so you said apricot and you said cherry, but you didn't say orange. So there is. I, d- I thought that was foolish though, because I just kept saying say quantro, say quantro, so and I was like, no, 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 no. You've been hurt before. There's a triple triple sec in there. Right. The main base we have is cognac. Oh, oh, oh. Cognac. So yes, terrifying yes. cognac. And then last of all, we have Suze. Hmm. Sue's. Well, you may remember Sue's. We've she's she's been on the show before. <laughs> Big Sue's. Big Sue's. Big Sue's. Remember Big Sue's? Oh, she's the French special. I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. So Sue's is a made from gentian root. It is a really bitter liqueur, gentian root, and some other botanicals and things. Slightly Campari esque. No, perhaps not quite as bitter as Campari. We've used it in a cocktail, but we also did it in the unboxing video on Patreon. We, which we I, did. I think it's on YouTube now. I, I might have made it public, but when we did an unboxing and we made a white Negroni we with it. We made a white Negroni, absolutely. So in lieu of Campari, we had we had Sue's. Absolutely. And we must make more white Negronis because that yeah, was good. spectacular. Absolutely, really good. Absolutely so lovely. yeah, so you got the Sue's in there, which adds a sort of bitterly, bitter herbally twang. I'm very frightened. It's very. I find it very pleasant to drink. I, I daren't have more than one because no. it is gonna it's gonna screw you over. It's one where I'd say this is strong, and that's yes. saying a lot from this is, us. This is damn strong. This is strong. This is not one for amateurs. 
<laughs> bless you out there. Professional drinkers only. Professional I mean, drinkers only. That sounds terrifying. Only. Now, that is it. Don't ask for one of these as your first cocktail of an evening when you're going no. out with your, your mates. Absolutely not. Don't this... try to have this if you're not if you're trying to impress someone and go, oh, I'll mix this up and you don't drink that much, you will die. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Things will happen. Exes will be texted. <laughs> yes. And it's not going to be fun the next day. So You can see me neck, neck and knocking this one back and then going... And then deeply regretting it. Because by the third sip, it's mellowed so much. Oh, Diffords, you geniuses. So yeah, it's terrifying, but good. Be wary of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> that does make it sound like the Eiffel Tower comes alive yeah, at night. it does. And, and if you drink enough of these, the it will. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. There we go. Well, with the Eiffel Towers firmly in hand, cautiously, cautiously, cautiously we don't... The Eiffel Tower's leading the way. It's come alive. <laughs> Are you ready for a story? Yes, I think I am. And this is a good drink for this story, because this okay. story is mad. Excellent. It's strong. And we are, of course, off to France. I should hope so after all that. Shocking. Now, a few people said when I said Paris as the ingredient, they said Paris green. But no, we're not doing Paris green. We are just going to good old Paris. And the setting is Paris. I will get that out of the way. Okay. Uh, I've not just gone, here's the address. Fuck it. That's the secret ingredient. No, Paris itself is a character. I feel, in the story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel this very strongly. I feel this very strongly in that it, it justifies what I've done. Okay. This story is set during La Belle Epoque. Oh, very nice. Mm-hmm. Very so nice, very nice. Paris is the melting pot for drama, for scandal, for the fury that surrounds this story. So this is a homage to the City of Lights. It's not a very good homage because people die in it. And, <laughs> and also stuff happens with... Well, you'll see. Actually, maybe okay. it's perfect. Yeah, just just tell me. Tell what's so, going yeah. on. And I will give you a warning. Kids, if you're listening, this does have some spice. Oh. So stop listening. Parents... Why? Why are you letting me I've do this? I've been swearing a lot since, <laughs> since we started. Oh, no, drinking and swearing is fine. But but there is some spice right. that's going to come up. Uh, everyone's leaning in now. Absolutely. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> so today we are going to tell the story of Marguerite Jean Jappy Steinhel. Okay. She was later the Baroness Abinger. Oh, fancy. But Marguerite. This is her story. Now, do you know the name? I, I've heard the name before. If it... This person, I don't know. But I've, <laughs> I've heard the name Marguerite. Well, soon you will. Okay. Soon you will never forget this. <laughs> so, Marguerite. Marguerite was born in the Alsace region of France in 1869 to a nicely wealthy family. Nice. Industrialists, and her maiden name was Jappy. So, her father caused quite the stir in the family because he was a wealthy family, yes, and had to marry in high society. But no, 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 no. He wanted to marry the daughter of an innkeeper, hmm. Emily. He was in love she was a lowly innkeeper's daughter. The family were like, no, 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 no. We want to have this. No, I shall marry for love. And he wouldn't be swayed and he took his share of the fortune and he would marry her. Good for him. Dampens the story slightly. She was 14 when he met her. Uh, uh, he sent her away to school for two years. That's generous. Generous, yes. And then uh, then he married her. So nice predatory behaviour there. But it was a happy marriage. Happy marriage. It was a happy marriage. They had children. And one of them was Marguerite. She was also known as Meg. So sometimes I'll call her Meg in the story because I'm like, too drunk to say Marguerite. <laughs> but I quite like saying Marguerite. Now, Marguerite was the apple of her father's eye, of course. She is pretty. She's charming. She's intelligent. She's had a very good education, thanks to her family. And daddy loves her and he dotes on her. And she's a, an heiress, really. Fancy. And that means she can get away with all sorts of shenanigans. You know, her charm... And her wit and her beauty are commented mm. on by all who know her. And they also, a lot of her school teachers and her ex-governesses just comment on like, which is very pretty and charming, but yes, n- troublesome, troublesome. <laughs> because she can do what she likes, yeah. essentially. Uh, well, fam- you would be if you could get away with bloody murder, can't you? Oh, abso- mm-hmm. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Father obviously wants her to, uh, you know, become a nice young lady and absolutely. settle down and be a wife. That's that's a wonderful ambition and a job for a that's woman what, to that's have. What, that's what ladies are for. Marguerite prefers trying to shag her father's friends <laughs> because she likes an old man <laughs> she does men give her attention and they give mm-hmm. her shiny things shiny things so the family spend a lot of their time running around after marguerite to try and stop her sleeping with people to go no no, no you must preserve your honor and your, your <laughs> wealth late for that <laughs> she's like ah screw it i mean yes it's commented on that they they stopped her getting into liaisons she clearly got into liaisons yeah. early on and who cares she doesn't care at all now tragically daddy does die in 1888, not by Jack the Ripper. <laughs> he didn't take a holiday. Every time we mention 1888, I'm going to mention Jack the Ripper. Oh, we good. know that. <laughs> it's a thing. 
Meg is heartbroken, heartbroken by her father's death. But yeah, also da- no daddy around now. Hmm. Think no. Of all that cash. Yeah, lots of cash coming to me and mother and you know the family, and also <laughs> no one's gonna tell me what to do. I can bloody well do what I like. Yep. She is young. She's rich. She's nineteen. Absolutely. What to do what to do. I imagine. I imagine there's a lot of a lot of gentlemen want to come and comforting. I come a calling. <laughs> <laughs> well, she has been growing up in, as I said, in the Alsace region. She's been growing out, uh, growing up in uh, different areas of France. She's in the Bourgogne region for a bit. She goes on holiday to the south of France with her sister. And she knows that there is a bigger life outside of some of the smaller areas. She's going to go to the very fancy parts of the south of France, but she has her sights set on one place. Mm. And who will get her there? She meets, when she is in the south of France, a painter named Adolphe. Steinhill. Okay. Now, he is from Strasbourg, okay. originally Burr. So he's 20 years older than her. Yeah, well, not uncommon in that time, I feel. Eyes light up. 19. Hello. Hello, my darling. Hello. And she, in turn, looks at him and thinks, oh, my goodness. You're from Paris, you say. Yeah, you're a painter from Paris. Mm. You're mm. older. It's Ooh. 1889 by now. Oh, my God. To go to yeah. Paris at this time? She thinks Adolf is her way to Paris, to society. Yes, he's 20 years older than her, but no problem. They're both getting something out of this relationship, I feel. And this is the peak time for everything we might think of of the golden age of Paris. This is La Belle Epoque. The Moulin Rouge has just opened. The Eiffel Tower has just been <laughs> built. It has just been built, Nick. The absinthe is flowing. This is right up her street. So in 1890, she goes to Paris as wife to Adolphe. They have one daughter, daughter Martha. She's really not heard of other than (laughs) there was a baby. She was around. She was there. (laughs) (laughs) She she figures on a little bit later, but she really doesn't have a say in the story. It's like, basically, Marguerite's gone, I've done my duty. I've gotten married. I've pushed out a kid. Um, Paris now. Where's the absinthe? Where is the absinthe? Duty done. Quickly, the marriage, which was sort of an arrangement in the first place, kind of starts to disintegrate where she is asking for a divorce. Within a year. Within a year. Now, divorce is still not chic. No. Not not great. It's going to attract its fair share of scandal. So an accord is sort of struck between her and Adolf where they go, look, no divorce, but let's just basically live separate lives. Yes, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. Absolutely. It was later alleged that Adolf, while he was taken with Marguerite and had married her, did prefer gentleman callers. Fair enough. He was fairly successful and mm. you can still get prints of his artwork. And, well, and when you look at them good. now... You're like, bloody hell, those are very good. But at the time, he was like, no, oh, he's all right. No, yeah, he's all right. Did a lot of portraits. So they make this accord. The marital home, live separately. You go off and entertain people. And we will not, I'm not going to stop you doing whatever you want to do. Allegedly. He knew very well what Marguerite yeah. was up to. I'm sure he was up to the same, though. Now, free, pretty much, from her boring old husband, Marguerite slipped straight into the role of a wealthy Parisian lady. And how do you get started in the artistic social circles back then? What would you do? Um, well, you've got to meet the right people. Mm-hmm. How would you do that? Go to the right restaurants, go to the theatres, mm-hmm. be seen in the fashionable places. Yes. Now, you're the sort of person who likes to do that sort of thing, but doesn't like to go out. There is that. Yes. So how do you make Paris come to you? Be just exquisitely bizarre and captivating <laughs> to make people want to come to you that but you might consider having a salon well yes yes now do you know the term salon i know yes i know it so have a bit of a, a bit of a uh, a soiree where you invite people to come and call on you mm. on a yes i'm going to be here it'd be very entertaining come along <laughs> that's more of a party Oh, okay. <laughs> so a salon. Now, this is a brief history of the salon because it is fascinating and it's really juicy and I love it because it's anything to do with the history of sort of court, in inverted commas, etiquette and how that evolved into high society, I like. So a salon is a step up from a dinner party. Mm. It is where you are known as a host, yes. um, certainly in this sort of time, and you are going to entertain the great and the good from the artistic world, but also the rich and powerful. And they're going to come to your house and there's going to be discussion. It's all about conversation. Ah, uh, okay. So you can see where it evolved from, was it rhetoric and from the French courts yes, you know, yes, way yes, back yes, when. Yes. But it is about conversation. You want to talk and you're going to discuss and you've got to look at art and you're going to talk about literature. And you 
political ideas of the day and exactly. such, discuss the, the latest goings on and things. Indeed, and sometimes there was like a ban on politics. Some places were like, we're not talking about politics. Others, it was only about government that right. you talk about. So this actually began in Italy in the 16th mm-hmm. century. You know, everyone thinks the Salon is exclusively French and it was really championed by the French uh, for reasons that I'll come on to. But it was, yeah, it gathered the great and the good together to, and they use the definition of um, Horace's poetry to either please or educate. Nice. That's what she wanted to do. Okay. Um, so started in big halls at first in mansions. For a while, salons were held in the bedrooms of ladies. That seems very intimate. <laughs> Which sounds saucy. Wasn't well. Mm. Oh, no, I can't imagine it was. I can't imagine it was saucy in a sort of a sexy way. <laughs> <But. Yeah. laughs> Is it's sort of in the 1600s? Then you have women who were the salons were taken out of the ballrooms because they were too big. And like these grand things, and it was meant to be an intimate gathering. And the woman would recline; she would recline on the bed, and people would pull up chairs, and she would lead the discussion. And I think this is something you can get on board with. Well, yeah, people just come and just like pull up a chair around your bed, and you just say, "Chat, t- tell me lovely things. <laughs> tell me, tell me, tell me lovely things. <laughs> tell me stories. Can we, is... can we start recording upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> I feel that this is the way it's going to go because then you can call it your salon. <laughs> We're going to discuss marvelous, lovely ideas. I will lie down. You can stand on the corner and tell me things <laughs> again which is again it's not often referenced but that's like evolution from roman what's there's a really nice little wormhole i went down as well the the salon and this reclining on the bed was kind of the counter to what they were also doing in the france called levit do you know what a levit is know, I don't know so this was where the heads of state the monarchs would have an audience with people when they got up in the morning so levit means to get up so levit mm-hmm. And it was really championed by Louis the Fourteenth, obviously, because he was dramatic. Mm, just a bit. But it's just basically you have kings who, the moment they get up and they get dressed, you would have an audience who would come in and different people from your mm. court or, or from the public, and they could chat with the king, and he would entertain them while he was dressing. And it's very dramatic. Very, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Loved it. And some kings and queens afterwards were like, I don't want to get up because I really can't deal with these people. <laughs> this was this was true. It was um, Louis XIV's son would stay in bed for as long as humanly possible because he was like, everyone's going to fucking come in yeah. to my room. <laughs> Everyone's going to ask me for stuff. It I? is. And the whole of the court was yeah. outside in a gallery. That was the grand levé. And then you yeah. had the petit levé inside. So, but this is how it evolved into mm. this salon that you have in people's houses. Today, you still have levé, uh, levés. Now has become an afternoon meeting well you'll meet and greet your public (laughs) so there you go the use of salons thrived and thrived and it moved out of the bedroom back into the living room and that is where you have the coffee shops in england but in the apartments in paris where you have famously the likes of gertrude stein Mm -hmm. which is later than our story but hemingway famously wrote about the salon that she had where you're rubbing shoulders with picasso and you're going to bubble with conversation and look at everyone's art and talk about the next poem you're writing and oh my god what a wonderful place and everyone (laughs) is (laughs) shit-faced hemingway was yeah absolutely well hemingway drank a lot but he i think he was sober most of the time he's in iron constitution (laughs) But this is exactly what Marguerite had set up. So there's the aside. There's the history of salons. Yep. But how, but how does she... Inc- she's, she's a new person in town. Mm. She's, she's an unknown yep. from a relatively industrial sort of region. she got money. She's, but yep. she's got money. She's not a title. She's not anything fancy. So how does she encourage people to, to come to her salon rather than the Count de Blah 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 <laughs> who's having another fancy salon down the road? I mean, the Blah Blah Blah's salons yeah. were very, they very were good. Very, they were He excellent. lay on a table and it was very strange. Through her husband. Uh, because he is a painter and he is not I don't want to paint the picture that he is a penniless like struggling romantic beautiful he's, artist he's well known he he's, is known he's commissioned he, has a reputation. Mm, he yeah. knows enough people and he can get into high society Fair so enough. this is the good accord that they strike that the husband will sometimes be commissioned to paint the portrait of quite powerful wealthy people Marguerite comes along and she says, oh, yes, I'd like to mm-hmm. meet you. And then, yes, you should come to my salon and everything. So he's established in the scene and he's got enough notoriety that she can be hosting parties. She gets to meet people and that's why they're coming Fair along. Enough. Okay. Also, Marguerite is very, very charming. Well, that helps. She's that very, helps. very charming. She opens up a home and the great and the good do indeed flock their artists, musicians, writers. So you will have the likes of Jules uh, Massenet, who wrote Manon. Also, the, the, the one of the people who developed the Suez Canal. Don't think he was good with the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, it's just a lot about 
engineering and r- rivers. <laughs> well, <laughs> you could think like in, in sort of the 1890s, a Degas would have turned up. And some of the others were like, you know, M- Monet was outside of Paris. Mm-hmm. Manet, I think, was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Toulouse the Trek was died in 1891. So he might have popped up briefly. He might have popped out and then just went, no. <laughs> but yeah, the guy who no. invented the Suez Canal was just going, hello, does anyone like boats? <laughs> anyone like boats? Mm-mm-mm. Oh, they invented some very nice bricks. Oh, lovely. <laughs> but her salons were less geared towards the real bohemia of artists certainly they would turn up but she was also very fond of politicians and financiers uh, so generally those two groups don't generally mix no it's money and power yeah they want to go to salons but they don't want to be debauched about it yeah they want some food and drink they want some good chat but they're you know the refined yeah, they're side. not they're not going to mix with the real bohemian sort of no characters. A, a, a dash of a sprinkling a sprinkling of that is fine but then mm. yeah absolutely but that's what marguerite wants out of these salons and that's what she sets up she wants to meet the politicians and the rich people because she's not only keen to be seen as a leading light in society she also wants to shall we say, work her way up the ranks okay. as a companion. Err. She knows that she can get in with the rich and powerful as a mistress. She's going to use her skills and she's not afraid of it. At all. <laughs> not ashamed. And no one's going to be ashamed well, of it. Well, no, one's gonna, no one's going to gossip about her. She's rich. Yeah. She's got an artist as a husband. No one minds. Everybody's doing Everyone's it. Everyone's doing it. She had a head screen on that she knew being the mistress of some of the top dogs in Paris was a tasty position. Ooh, uh. <laughs> she took on many lovers. And one of the ways she stayed wealthy was also one of the ways she got into high society. So husband, who is the painter, mm. gets to do the introductions. Rather than being paid for her services, which would be disgusting. You know, she, she would be a common, common prostitute. Yeah, none of that. Sex workers work. But back then, mm-mm. what she wanted to do was... She made her lovers buy her husband's paintings. Oh, okay. Yeah. So her husband was sometimes commissioned to paint the people she was about to shag. Right. And so that's how she met them. And then other people she met and said, oh, why don't you just buy my husband's art? You just buy my husband's <laughs> art in exchange for what I've just done. <laughs> And that was the arrangement. Okay. So her, the money was coming into the household. Her husband was kept in work, and that meant he could then go and meet and all the more more fancy people. Exactly, rich yeah. money in the house. Everybody's happy. Oh, well, it seems to work absolutely. I mean, it's ingenious. It's, it is quite ingenious. I think good for her. <laughs> they've got they've got a system that works for everyone. Yeah, so and everyone's happy. I, I did take. I did go and look up his paintings because for a while I was like, "Are oh, these people buying these shitty paintings?" <laughs> going, "I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I've shagged your wife." <laughs> or he's just drawing a penis and going, "That would be a thousand <laughs> francs." That was okay. how it worked. Nice. But while Marguerite entertained politicians and statesmen and rich men, all of whom were smitten by her and up to their eyes in paintings, mm. <laughs> she had her sights set on one man. Oh, the king. Eighteen nineties. Not no king. king. <laughs> oh yeah, he's been his head's cut off. That would be weird. Yeah, that would be weird. That's no, king think down. Down, down from the king. Le président. Ah, oh, le président. Le président. <laughs> oh, this is why the le président, le président. Was, was an alternative <laughs> ingredient <laughs> that you sent me. I sent you many ingredients. You, you did. I did, <laughs> and one will become very, very clear very soon. But le président, le président, Felix Four. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But President Felix Four. Now, President Four. Is pretty famous in his own okay. right. He is the subject of this is niche reference, but mm. hopefully most people will understand part of it. He was the subject of em- Emil Zola's famous uh-huh. letter to the Laurent newspapers entitled Jacques. Oh, very good. Yes. Right. So, do you know what that's about? I I, I know of it. I, I must admit, I don't know the details. Jacques. Massive headline. Yes. People use it all the time. Absolutely. Jacques, Jacques. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. So very, very quickly. I'm not going to go into the history of it. But this was where Zola wrote this piece because Four, President Four, and the French government were involved in something called the Dreyfus Affair. <gasps> yes. You know about the Dreyfus I Affair? I do know this. So this is basically anti-Semitism. Yes. Very, very quick. This is the, the skimming over it. But an officer called Dreyfus was accused of treason to the French government, of selling secrets. He was Jewish. He was set up. It would later be discovered. Someone else had been selling secrets this person was accused, and, and the whole of the country was split down the middle yep. and it was about anti-semitism so this whole front page article in Laurent 
was to the president saying Jacques. Yeah, oh, that's very famous. Yes, very, 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 very good. Very famous indeed. What else he did, he sort of was just le president for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> he just did that. Um, his other lovely claim to fame is that he didn't like cars. Okay. Paris, France was the biggest automobile industry in the world at the mm. time, biggest producer. But he turned up at the Paris Motor Show and said, will you say a few words? And he said, no. your cars are very ugly and they smell very bad. <laughs> Well, championing industry there. Well done, mate. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's who Marguerite has her sights set on. Okay. And in 1897, Le President meets Marguerite. <gasps> Instantly spitten. Now, apparently, it's because Adolf, her husband, is commissioned to do his painting. Mm-hmm. Fancy. So that's the way in. But either way, they have this meeting. He's smitten. She is a beautiful, intelligent sexually accomplished Mm. woman she is sure of herself she has gotten her wish and soon she is the president's mistress people say that she is now trying to be the equivalent of madame pompadour yeah absolutely i was just thinking that very thing she's very yes louis the 15th so yeah she's she doesn't have as much power anywhere no 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 no. but in society potentially in sort of in sort of in opening doors of getting into mm. the fan- the fancy places and mixing with the the very highest of folk. Absolutely. Then absolutely yeah, she's she's in there. She's in there. She's not his only mistress, mm. but she she's going to get all the benefits yeah. of it and she's loving it. The president f- followed suit. Whether he originally commissioned Adolf to paint his portrait, he certainly was buying up all his pictures <laughs> constantly. Yeah, 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 more pictures. Yeah, fine. More Bring pictures. <laughs> Stateroom covered in shit, basically. But things are looking up for Marguerite. But why am I setting such a scene of social etiquette? Well, I don't know. Why are you? Framing these historical characters to tell in such detail. But we've talked of the etiquette of kings and queens, the bohemian still dignified lifestyle, and the practices of the salon, all very refined. Well... We're about to bring things right back down (laughs) into the gutter, Nick. Okay, good, good. Perhaps with the most famous story associated with dear, dear Marguerite. Okay. And I think that calls for another drink. Well, I think we're going to need one by the sounds of it. (laughs) So the gutter, you say? You've never been there before. Well, that looks fun. Can I join in? (laughs) Well, let's see. 16th of February, 1899. On the turn of the century. Turn of the century. Marguerite heads to the Palais de Elysee through the back door. Of course. What, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> she is led in by the guards. They know her well and they know the score. She is here to help the president write his memoir. Absolutely. Of course. Late into the night, <laughs> scribbling away in the blue room. <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed the blue room. Blue room. Mm. Marguerite, when she turns up, the president likes to make his preparations. It was reported that he liked to take it, our old friend Spanish fly. Oh, does he indeed? Yes, prepare for all that writing. Um, oh, all that writing. You need a bit of cantharidin for all that writing. Absolutely. Way into the night. <laughs> And normally it would be a night of heavy writing. Heavy writing. Heavy writing. Heavy writing. And then she would slip out the back door and no one would utter a word. No, absolutely. But on this night... Screams are heard. Oh. Goodness me. Shouts. Good screams? Bad screams? Well, d- different from what d- they d- normally different, hear. Different screams. Different screams. Enough to make the servants go, mm. So they go to the room and tentatively, look, oh God, oh God, we've got to open the door. <laughs> they open the door and the servants enter. Now what they see becomes legend. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to give you the best version of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in tent hooks. The president is lying on his couch. Okay. He's unresponsive. <gasps> He does seem quite dead or at least dying. Oh. There's no hope for him. A victim of a stroke. Some oh. people at first think it's a heart attack, but it would later transpire it is a stroke. Oh, that's, that's good. And, oh God, and his trousers are around his ankles. Oh. Well, that's fine. He was probably getting ready for bed. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the stroke shook off his trousers. Yes. Oh, he collapsed. He was standing near to the couch. Yeah. Had a stroke, tumbled, tumbled onto the couch. Tumbled back. Of course, of course. And Marguerite is there ad- adjusting her clothes. Yes. She, she probably just fell down with the shock of, of, of the, the stroke. stroke. Exactly. Witnessing such a horrifying thing. And when you fall down, your clothes pop open. They do. They do. Often happens. And she's there on her knees. Yes. Trying to put her clothes back together. And that's when they notice the president's hand, his dead hand, yeah. is very much clutching the back of her head. Oh, dear. I, I'm, I'm slightly getting where you're going with this, I have to say. <laughs> now, maybe she was trying to help and she was like, let me pull up your trousers, please, yeah, President. Mm. No, President, for uh, his most famous legacy is the manner of his death. I have never heard that before. And that is brilliant. <laughs> I mean, 
I mean, there are worse ways to go. Mm. <laughs> Suffered a stroke while reportedly receiving oral pleasure. Yes, I mean, that, I know, there are worse ways, worse ways to go. From Fair Marguerite. Mm. That version of it is, is that he was... she was that good? That brought good. Brought on a stroke. That good. And his hand spasmed on death and <laughs> was gripping her hair to the point where the servants had to cut her hair off oh, God. to remove his hand. Some even say they had to break his fingers. But she's stuck there. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marguerite is ushered away. Ushered away. Oh, no, never mind. Uh, yeah. Natural causes. Na- he did die of natural causes. Yes. But uh, within the course of minutes, the story is across Paris. Yeah. And it would be both played down and embellished. Obviously, this is the president. All he did was he had a heart attack while his woman who was writing the memoirs showed a bit of ankle. Oh, my God, he died. And then the other versions are she is fully naked on her knees, still still, still doing. Still, still cracking on. Still cracking on. <laughs> but the hand thing, I think, is true. Everyone's like, he yeah. had his hand in her hair. And she was like, get him up. <laughs> but the fatal stroke. Mm. Way. Oh, God. Did the president in? Did, 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 did him in? Did now, him did in. she kill him with her passion? With her passions. With her, the, passions. With her seemingly terrifying skills. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's great for her reputation? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, she's shagged the, pre- the president. Yeah. She wanted to. Uh, she's killed him. Yeah. Uh, potentially, he's died on the job. Um, she she is so good that she has killed the head of state. That he sucked his soul out for heaven's sake. <laughs> He won't get into heaven. <laughs> no, rather than taking this as a warning, the chaps line oh, up. Oh, God, yeah. Like every politician. <laughs> oh, I want some of that. <laughs> Everyone who was in the inner circle is like, and her number is, yeah, where, where does she live? Yeah. Where does she live? Oh, no, let me t- find out what you know. And also, <laughs> hello. <laughs> no one cares about their health when they've heard about this. She is given various nicknames. Um, she is called the Kiss of Death. Yeah, well, oh, that's mm-hmm. the, the, the subtle and polite. I like that. <laughs> there, she's, also, worse. <laughs> she's also called, so it is a slang term. Uh, I'm not going to read the French out on air because it... it, it, it now wrong. I need to know. Well, no, the, 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 the French term is, is another term for Undertaker. So, les pompes funèbres. Okay. But that also is very similar to oral sex. Okay. So it's a slang term right. back then. Other people right now would dispute it because it's sort of changed over years. But gotcha. Le Pompe Funebre is also <laughs> the kiss of... Yeah. The Little Death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very poetic. It's very loud. Yeah, very, very, very yes. yeah, uh, she's, the un- <laughs> she's the undertaker. Yes, yeah, like in the wrestling terms. Of, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Shag's more politician, wealthy businessman than she can bloody manage. It's Excellent. great in the years that follow. Dear old Adolf, he can't keep up with the <laughs> painting. Painting, 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 painting. painting. <laughs> He gets weird commissions. <laughs> but shockingly enough, Nick, mm. this is not the death. I, well, I would hope not. That is associated <laughs> with Marguerite that I wanted to say. It is the death. It, yes. But it's not the only one. Oh, and it okay. is not the end of her tale. Because the end of her tale takes a really bizarre twist. Okay. I like a bizarre twist. By 1908... She's lived a few years on the infamy of her actions. She's had many a lover. She's enjoyed a very, very good time. And she's continued her lifestyle. But husband's getting older now. He can't paint as much. He can't take on as many commissions. And that's her means of income drying up. Also, she's getting a bit on. She's getting on her as well, really, isn't she? She's still lovely. She's still charming. And very good at her job. (laughs) Very good at her job, but there's only so long after, you know, seven or eight years that you can live in infamy. Yeah. And if she doesn't have an income through her husband, what is she? Yeah. She's just a prostitute. Just a prostitute. And also the lovers, she has several over the years, and there are reports that they lose interest before she does, which Mm. is not what she wanted. No, absolutely. She kind of wants to maybe settle down and start getting married and get something secure, but she's still married to Adolf. And the other people are kind of like, yeah, no. And mm-hmm. there's there's one really good story where she would get the attentions of younger men by fainting on trains. And so they would have to carry her lap. home. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. No, but they would, not that. But <laughs> they, would, they would then help her home yes. and then she would seduce them. But one guy that she seduced in her later, well, not later years. She's not old by now. But he meets the husband and like is convinced to sort of commission a painting. He's like, oh, for God's sake, this is the con that they have going. And he feels so sorry for the husband that he calls off the affair with her. Oh. Because he's like, this is a real cuckold situation. Uh. This is just grim. And it's all getting a bit sad now. Oh, dear. So this is the state of their life. 
1908. Yeah. And this is where things get weird. Okay. Morning of the 31st of May, 1908, in Marguerite's and Adolf's marital home. Adolf's valet awoke to the sounds of, of muffled screams oh. from one of the bedrooms. Where he just goes, no, oh, Marguerite, no, you. But he's like, okay, now this is weird. This doesn't mm. normally happen in the house. He goes downstairs and he enters a room. It's actually the daughter's room, but she's away from the okay. house. But in there, he finds Marguerite naked, bound, and gagged, oh. tied to the bed. He's like, don't I, I, see that. Like, should I ask questions? Should yeah. I ask questions? Goes over, removes the gag, and she screams. Burglars have broken in. She said they have been attacked by four hooded men oh. who came into the house, bound and gagged her, attacked her, knocked her out, looking for money. Later on, she said they're looking for papers. The valet raises the alarm, raises the alarm and brings the police into the house. They search the rest of the house and looking in the other bedrooms, they find Adolf and her mother, Emily, dead. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. They appear to have suffocated. Now, the details of their death are hard to find in terms mm. of the autopsy, but both of them have suffocated. Some say they've been strangled, but they're dead. They're dead. They're very much dead. They are dead. Now, Marguerite is claiming four people in black hooded cloaks broke into the house. They threatened her with a gun. They wanted money. Others were talking about paperwork later on and saying, like, you know, they wanted stuff. They knocked her out, stripped her naked, apparently tied her to the bed, went on and killed Adolf and Emily. And the mother. Yeah. Yeah. The police are suspicious. What one would hope. Obviously, foul play. Yeah, foul play. There's something indeed. But let's let's just say that maybe they are thinking they are not Marguerite's biggest fans. Okay. They are looking at her, going, "Okay, why are you alive?" That's true. They didn't seem to be bothered about killing anyone else. You're alive, but two other people have suffocated or strangled. Yeah. They're, they're dead in the house. Why? How you? did you escape? If these four ruthless killers, why did they tie you up and murder everyone else? Exactly. What possible reason would there be for them doing this yeah. and letting her live, a pretty famous woman? Now, it did transpire that black robes had been stolen by a ne- from a nearby theatre. Okay, nice. Nice drama. But there's drama. no trace of them. There's no trace of them. There's little to no evidence against Marguerite to allow an arrest. There's no evidence anywhere about mm. what the hell has happened in this house. And the police are not big fans of hers as i've said they're kind of going okay what well, what the hell but they're also going well we don't really have she didn't freaking... tie herself up no so well, yeah what yeah. do we have yeah. what do we have to prosecute her or anyone what doesn't help marguerite is marguerite because well, how she... often does that happen though <laughs> this is just like you are like, oh no and then yeah they go off on one is like you're really not helping yourself oh here, she is pointing the finger at bloody everyone yeah she is so determined to try and find suspect she is frantically naming anyone, anyone. who could have been responsible she suddenly insists the servant Remy Colliard, who was the one who found her was that he's did it he did it he is the one who struck us and he must be behind all of this and she has the police search his clothes she finds a pearl a pearl in his clothes that belonged to her he's stolen Mm. my jewelry she points the finger at the son of the housekeeper she points the finger at a patron of the theater where the robes were stolen who turns out to have a cast iron alibi (laughs) as in i just came in today to buy a (laughs) ticket and i'm not even from here what are you doing fingers all of them the butcher the baker the candlestick maker it everyone is suddenly a suspect the police as they're reporting this story the press pick it up they print a picture of the pearl that was taken from remy's clothes Mm. in the paper Local jeweler says, I recognize that pearl. It is Marguerite's. She came in and had that removed from a ring two weeks after the murder. Oh, oh, oh Marguerite. And somehow it's ended up in his pocket. Yeah. Her over the top accusations end up with the police making her the prime suspect. The lady does protest too much. She I does. Feel. She oh. does. The drama has gotten to her. She is arrested for murder in November of that year. So several months after the attack. Her trial is held a year later. So Mm. she spends a year in jail awaiting trial. And she spends that time in a notorious prison. It's a horrible prison. Not a pleasant place. No, no, no. Some of the prisons are fine. This one, not good. Not Not good at all, famously. But the trial starts. Everybody turns up. I can well imagine. (laughs) Tickets are limited. Because tickets are sold yeah. to attend. The most shocking thing about people who turn up, Marcel Proust turns ah. up. 
and everyone's shocked because like, he never gets up before midday and he's, <laughs> he's here. here for that. He is, with pen ready. <laughs> Everybody turns up to see this trial. Now, the prosecution claimed that Marguerite had killed her husband and her mother because she was in the way because she wanted to remarry. She wanted to remarry, mm-hmm. settle down to a wealthy gentleman. She had many good, wealthy suitors. Still, they were dropping off, but she had enough. That's why she wanted them dead. The judge, the judge who was not at all biased, <laughs> listed all of her affairs because there were witnesses and there were servants when they had been accused, came forward and go, right, I'll tell you bloody everything about her and everyone she shagged and the judge is reading out all of the affairs she's had with statesmen with politicians with kings from other countries all these people in the press are loving this loving this absolutely writing it down and he's very much like yes you 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 debase woman you dreadful rumors spread like wildfire in the press and it's noted in one paper that does side on the anti-semitism side Mm. with all of this stuff back to the Dreyfus affair back to the president and her involvement in it, and they claim that she poisoned the president. Oh, God. She didn't just suck him to death. <laughs> <laughs> that she had poisoned she him, and she was a him. spy, and all of these. So they spy right. for who? I don't know. Um, but to undermine him, all of this political intrigue kicks in, mm. and all these rumours. But in court, Marguerite, calm, collected. Okay, good. She admits, yes, she has had multiple affairs. Yeah. She says that her husband didn't know about it, so saves him in oh, a way. Oh, well, that's very good of her. Okay. Yeah, so she, she lies, but she yeah. says he didn't know anything about it, but yes, I've had affairs. Doesn't mean that I've killed anyone. And she insists True. that four people broke in and robbed the house, and I don't know what happened to them. And I will happily admit to what I've done in my private life, but this has no bearing on okay. these killings. I'm I'm paraphrasing this because I haven't read the yeah, whole court absolutely. of reports. She said that when she blamed others, she was panicking. She was absolutely terrified because maybe you would be. Maybe you would be. Well, well erratic, if, if the, poli- the, the police are there thinking it's you, you're, are you not going to try and potentially come up with other possibilities? To if the, save if, your own skin. To save your own skin. The police are there thinking it's you. You're going to go, well, no, it wasn't me. You're so yeah maybe Maybe. i I can see people throwing other people under the bus to save themselves potentially the pearl thing that's yeah that's a bit much isn't it really you never know what people will do it's an it's a it's a it's a debate we could have later but none of her previous partners come forward uh, either as witnesses for the prosecution or the defense they they, they go i'm out of the country i'm sure they're distancing themselves quite a lot her latest lover though one of her latest lovers who was a mayor comes forward and very passionately defends her. Says he loves her. Everything that you're talking about is not the Marguerite that I know. This is the evidence that's laid up. I will say that Marguerite, when she was describing the people in the hooded clothes, she did not use very uh, progressive language. She was quite anti-Semitic. She was trying to imply that they were Jewish and this whole political... It's it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. No, no. The prosecution really had nothing to pin on her other than her saucy reputation. So Marguerite was acquitted of murder. Wow, well, yeah, I can see they've got no evidence against her. Much to the chagrin of the judge who still called her stories a tissue of lies. Mm-hmm. Mm. Now, what happened to Adolf and his mo- and her mother, Emily, was never solved. Yeah. Adolf had been smothered, had suffocated in some way. Emily apparently had choked on her dental plate. Okay. But she wouldn't have worn that to bed. So people were like, she choked on it. And then was moved. Oh, right. But mm. no one knows what happened to them. Yeah. No details. What reason would Meg have for doing this? Or was she working with others? The rumours would circulate later on. Did Marguerite possess documents that the president had entrusted with her for years and years? The memoirs that they were writing together. In the end, Paris no longer wanted Marguerite Mm. around. The once glamorous socialite was now stained with a tragic murder accusation and her looks had faded. It was commented on in a really horrible way. The year in prison, in that horrible prison where cockroaches crawled over you while you slept, didn't do anything. It's not going to do you any good, is it, really? Yeah, for the last of her youth. She was now called the Red Widow in Paris. She decided to move to London, where Mm. she lived under the name Madame du Sarinac. She wrote her memoirs. She gave sort of veiled comments about her life in Mm. the memoirs. Oh, no, lurid details about who she slept with in terms of the president and the papers and the memoirs that she had. Very vague, but never really committing to Mm. anything. She would later marry the sixth Baron, Abinger. Nice. But was widowed in 1927. She eventually moved to Hove in Sussex. (laughs) Okay. Down by the seaside. Down the road from us. (laughs) 
and she died in 1954. 54, wow. Aged 85 years old. That's brilliant. Well, that's an exciting life to have lived, though. But that is the story of Marguerite. I mean, the Red Widow. Very good. The Undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't have people who live, li- who live lives like that anymore, do you? I mean, yeah. I mean, that, that is <laughs> full on. Sort of, I mean, she lived life to the full. Absolutely. I mean, she went. She wanted something. She went for it. And and which is brilliant. I mean, potentially murder people. That's less good. But eh, did she? Who knows? The the murder stories at the end are such a weird addition to her life. It and is. Normally, that would be a story in itself. The yeah. details are sort of almost glossed over because everyone is fascinated with her past. Yeah. And the death of the president. I mean, that's. I mean, that. I mean, what a what a what a way to go. <laughs> I mean, what a way to go. So. Uh, he died happy. He died happy. <laughs> but yeah, she wanted to live in Paris. She was wealthy, had this yeah. accord with her husband, was in the echelon, you know, the upper echelons of society. He was able to host the salons, was able yeah. to live that gorgeous, glamorous um, life that we all kind of go, oh, wouldn't it be lovely? Yeah, absolutely. And was a mistress to the great and the powerful. And I mean, was like, she, yeah, screw it. Okay. I mean, I'm slightly in love with her. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, she sounds pretty awesome. The murders at the end are weird now there was one theory there was one theory that i read the the other writers have covered in 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 years later and i'm going to paraphrase it here is that this was a horrific accident gone wrong that she had many lovers she had a lover who turned up to the house confronted adolf and their theory was is that they got into a fight and adolf died by accident as in the windpipe was crushed so the strangulation and the smothering right so like if you we all know these are freak accidents and it could happen that yeah. um that if you're hit in the wrong way that's it true enough the mother had a heart attack and then choked um, on her yeah. dental plate and this was just an awful series an awful, of events yeah absolutely and then she kind of went to the lover right tie me up and i'm just going to pretend this was a robbery yeah maybe which is very dramatic and I mean, very, very extreme I mean, it's very and much, very it's agatha very, christie but it is very much so but otherwise no one's ever been able to go well why would she kill her husband I can't see and why would she kill her mother she yeah. loved her mother apparently she really got on well with her mother i can't see what see what she's got to gain from mm. from those things i mean it's not as if he's been cramping her style no um around town or anything mm. like that and and the mother seems entirely unnecessary mm. but so, then if it was someone entirely random who had broke into the house for a robbery why would they kill two and leave one if it was completely her? a random robbery burglary or whatever then why if you're happy to kill two people you might as well kill a third why well, leave them tied up the other theories the two other that, that again i'll paraphrase is that this is if she orchestrated it with mm. another lover is that for some reason she decided adolf had served his purpose she wanted to marry but she didn't want the scandal of divorce I mean, having been the person who killed the president with a blowjob. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, she doesn't seem that scandal averse. Yeah. Really. So, so um, why kill him and her mother in order to marry someone else? And and yeah. people were like, that just doesn't make sense. Doesn't, doesn't make sense. But the the idea of the people in the hooded cloaks is very prejudiced, and it's not nice. No. But her saying that she had secrets from the president. I mean, that is also, I think, is probably a. No, I'm not. But why not kill her either. to silence yeah. her? Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. If she, if the president has given her secrets, she's the one who's got them. Yeah, and they need to be silenced. Then God, do I with her? Yeah. Not, not the mother and the husband. Yeah. So it does seem entirely. It's, I think that this this mm. whole thing about people in hooded robes coming in, I I feel very uncomfortable about that, and that is just her kind of going, oh, let's just lean into some anti-Semitism here. Yeah, absolutely, it's in the papers, and that's what I'm famous for. Yeah, <laughs> so. and and people covered it, and people ambassadored her for it, but also some of the press were like, yeah, 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 with yeah, these absolutely. people and everything, because it was really horrible divide at that yeah. time. But a bizarre end to but, an incredible, m- mad life. But then also, it means something that she got away, with, not got away with, but something yeah. that she. She then she got through that that chapter, moved to moved to London, married a, a baron, married had a, baron. a fantastic. I'm sure the baron wasn't short of a few bob. Yeah, was made a widow, moved to Hove, quite fancy. She 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 lived quite and lived quietly, a, a quietly but very comfortably. And people would have thought her very glamorous. I mean, like and again, like if you live out your your later years, go to a seaside town, in probably a very good apartment. She died yeah. in a nursing home. 
Cooper in a very good apartment being this mysterious French yeah, woman. I mean, I, I'm not often jealous of people we cover, <laughs> I have to say. But she has, she has, I mean, she's lived an, ex, an exciting, life. exciting life that you don't just don't get anymore. No. You don't get people who live those sorts of lives. Yeah. Of, of doing all these amazing <laughs> crazy things living through the belle epoque and then dying in the 50s which seems mad i know 85 uh, yeah she fucking did well so, didn't she it's, yeah i mean i'm fucking good for her <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna side on it that she wasn't a horrible murderer at I, the end that's what that's what i'm going with i could be entirely wrong and she was a vicious uh, nazi piece of work but... so, something happened there <laughs> something happened but I, well, I it doesn't seem to add up yeah. but we'll we'll let people decide on it but yeah that's why i wanted to give you the background of the I salons like and everything because Really sets like the that. scene there you go that's a good that's a damn good story <laughs> it's one of those ones you find you go oh i'm definitely doing that, doing that one. <laughs> so there you go the story of marguerite jappy later steinhell later the baroness the baroness uh the red widow and uh suck machine <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> it's the worst things happening to tombstone potentially <laughs> Le <mort> de la <laughs> What do you think, people? What do you think of Marguerite's story? Are you jealous of her? Would you like to have lived in the Belle Epoque? What do you think of her approach to life? Do you think... What what version of the story do you go with? Mm. What, how the president died? <laughs> because it's We know a, how he died. It's amazing how much people tried to clean it up and then yeah. embellish it. It is great <laughs> but also what about the murders as well this very mm. almost a footnote that you have to really dig through to get detail do you think she was responsible do you think she was the victim of something bigger that was going on or some sort of or very entirely weird accident? random chance that some burglars picked that house and picked a famous and woman with a, a reputation woman, yeah. tell us what you think jump on the comments of this episode and spill your thoughts we would love to know what you think about this one but most importantly you must with caution with caution but with delight mix up Le Tour Eiffel, Le Tour Eiffel. I mean, it's gone down a tree we've both finished ours mm, um, you finished yours much quicker I did and you <laughs> can you tell by the drunkenness <laughs> in my voice but yeah the rest of will be out on Friday it's a, it's a good one it's a killer it so is. beware enjoy but please beware it's one <laughs> we've drunk this we've we both had a negroni beforehand you've had another I've had, no, you've, I've you've, now, you've had three i've now had three <laughs> i've had one negroni and that cocktail and i feel like it's 11 o'clock yeah i feel like time has stopped and that, for everyone's clarification it's actually 10 to 8 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. we should retire to the salon or go clubbing and go cl- <laughs> <laughs> let's go dancing <laughs> I do get what you mean. I'm kind of like, yeah, I can do anything right now. Or we'll host a salon. Or we'll host a salon. And we'll smoke cigarettes. An impromptu salon. And we'll talk about musicals. And we'll read from books. Oh, that sounds great. No, let's just do that <laughs> Let's now. just do that. It's just you and me just going, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you are doing this weekend, host your own salon Absolutely. and sen- send us pictures of it. We'd love to know, who would you invite to your salon? I'll ask you a question. <gasps> who would be your great and good from the artistic world? Let's leave politics out of it. Yep. <laughs> who would you invite? Tell us what you're doing. Share pictures of the cocktails that you mix up because we love to see them and share them on social media. Keep sending us suggestions of lovely lovely stories that we can cover and thank you from the bottom of our hearts to everyone who has left us a lovely review on apple itunes the reviews really really help if you can leave us a review please do thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisoner's cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you au revoir